Leif, take it away. All right. Thank you. So, hi, my name is Leif. I don't have any slides for you. I will just show a bunch of things live. I work as kind of do it everything on Vardin. I mostly do architecture related stuff, but I also do all the other things that nobody else does. Uh, and yeah, what, what we're going to talk about today is uh, this thing in, in Flow that is named Execute JavaScript. Uh, and it's, it's a really powerful thing that lets you embed or e integrate any kind of JavaScript thing in your Flow application. Because if you really think about it, your application runs in the browser, which means that anything sooner or later will happen as JavaScript that ha happens in the browser. So by speaking directly JavaScript, you can kind of do all the things that you could do in any other kind of application. So you can kind of break the limitations that you have from, from just server-side Java. Two different things that these are useful for. One is to integrate different kinds of components, like for instance, uh, all the Vardin web components that you use, like the grid and the button and so on, they are implemented in this way. But also if you go to, for instance, the Vardin directory and find lots of different components there, like Google Maps and, and all lots of other things, they also use the same mechanisms. And the other thing that you can do is to, uh, when you have an existing component or, or something, and you just want to tweak something that isn't supported with the Java API, then if you happen to know that, okay, this is still possible to do somehow with JavaScript, maybe because it's integrating something with more features or, or something, then you can also just kind of hack yourself into it. The example I will be using to show this concept for you is a grid implementation. So I tried to come up with what's the kind of suitable, difficult thing, but still manageable to do. And since Vardin is, like we saw in the previous presentation, all about lots of data, then the grid is perfect for that. So you can actually, if you want to follow along here in the GitHub rep repository, and these steps here are basically what we'll be looking at. So to get started, I have cheated a little bit. This is the first version of this application or this grid integration. And it doesn't look like much, but you can see that there's this border here and that's actually where the grid ends, but it's, it's completely empty. And to do this, this is all the code I have. So, uh, or actually starting here, we have a view that just creates our new custom grid class component and add, adds it to view. And what this does, it has a bunch of annotations. It has NPM package saying that we should load a JavaScript package from, from the NPM registry. And we also define a version of it. Then I have at JS module telling flow that whenever this component is used somewhere in the application, then this script file or the, 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 the script of, of this module should be also included in the, in the bundle that is loaded. And then finally, I'd have at tag, which again says that when an instance of this component is created and added to the application, then in the browser, the counterpart there should be use vadin-grid as the HTML element name. And that's all we need to get the grid there. But of course, that's not all we want to do. So we actually want to get some data in here. And always, when you want to do any kind of JavaScript integration, you should start with thinking, how would I do this without Vardin or, or Flow, basically, at all? How would I do it if I just would, would build this in a client-side application? Or, or basically, what's the kind of native way of doing things? So that's also what I will be looking at here for the grid. So looking at the documentation, I see, well, here we have a grid with some columns and some data. So let's see how that is done. And looking at the source, we see that, well, we have a wide grid element. It has an items property, which I see that, well, okay, I don't see it here, well, but I know it, that it's, it's just a 
a list of items. And then for each column, there's a voting grid column as a child, which just has a path attribute defining which part of the, of the data it should use. And then also the header caption is directly based on that. So let's build that for our grid. So I want to um, get those, those columns first. I want to have an ID column and a value column. And these are the paths I want to use. So then for each of those, I create a new body grid um, column element like this. And then I set the path attribute. And then finally, I need to add this to the grid. And to do that, I get the element that is kind of backing this grid component. And then I append the column as child. And the next thing is to get some kind of data there to see that we're doing. So uh, I want to get a range of numbers and just create one object per, 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 per number there from one to 100. Uh, and I want to have these as generic JavaScript objects. So JSON basically, this is an item. And then for each item, I put in an ID property, which is the index. And then I put in a value property, which is value, and then just the index. And then I need to return the item. And then I want to collect these into a JSON array. Um, there is in flow an internal um, helper, uh, JSON util uh, as array, which does exactly this. You should maybe not use it because we don't promise to maintain it. So you might have to do this manually, but I'm cheating a little bit here. And then we get the ele element and set a property items as JSON. So this is all we would need to do here. So what we're doing here is we are kind of creating child elements. We're setting attributes on those. Uh, and then we're also creating a more kind of complex data structure and setting that as a property. And in HTML, you have these kind of almost similar but quite different things, which is attributes and properties. An attributes, that's what you set kind of through HTML. So for instance, if you look at this example, then path equals and then something, that's an attribute. Properties on the other hand, they are set as JavaScript. So you cannot just from native HTML set properties. But for instance, this example uses lit HTML where you can use dot something and then you actually can use a JavaScript expression. So in that way you can assign properties. In most cases, these are kind of one-to-one. -one, so the same element supports for instance, path could also be set as a property, but there are so, some special cases where that's not working. But anyways, now with these couple of lines of Java code, I now have this grid with 100 items here. The next thing I want to do uh, is to make, so that I can select items in this grid, because now if I try to interact with it, I can select text, but I cannot really kind of select items. And again, looking at, how would I do this manually? So here we have a single selection example in the documentation. If I click a row, then it's highlighted. If I click another one, that one is highlighted. If I click that one again, it's de-highlighted and so on. The way this works is that it listens to this active item changed event, and then it gets an event. And from that event, it gets details and the value there. And that's the item that was was activated or deactivated. And then the way it's done here is that uh, if you have an item, then we create an array containing only that one item. Otherwise, you use an empty array. And then we set that as selected items, which is then also bound to the selected items property on the actual grid. So that's a couple of steps to untangle. Uh, I would recommend, especially with these kind of integrations, to always do it one step at a time because you have lots of opportunities for typos because we have lots of hard-coded strings and so on that we need to use. So always take it slowly so that you 
kind of if you make a mistake then you don't have five steps to to see through that did i did i do this right did i do that right but anyway what we want to do is to listen to this uh, uh item uh, active item changed event from java and uh, there are two ways of doing that one is kind of a low level way using get element dot uh, add event listener it's a little bit more flexible but it it's again it's a more low level thing and it and just the code isn't as readable. I will instead show the more high level way, which is uh, we actually define um, an event class for this. So active uh, item change event, and that extends a component event, which is part of flow. And then we define that the source of this kind of event will also always be a custom grid instance. And then we need to give it a constructor. Uh, these are the things that are there by default. We want to add one additional thing there, which is uh, the ID of the selected item. And let's put that to a field. And with this, we could already now listen to these events. Um, so we use component util, which just basically contain stuff that should be in a component class, but we don't want to put them there because we want to keep the API cleaner. So things that are not so often used, we instead put in the util class and, and you can use them from there instead. So we want to add a listener to this component class and the type is this active item change event class. And then what we want to do here, um, again, as I said, take things one step at a time. So we just, uh, if event ID, is null, then we show a notification so saying deselect and otherwise we show a notification so show saying select and then also id so far this i mean it compiles but it doesn't do what we want we need to also add a little bit of metadata to this event class so that flow knows that it should do something also on the client side when we add listeners for this. So I can add the DOM event annotation here and put the name of the DOM event there. And the second thing I do is that for this parameter, I need to tell flow how to actually find this value in the browser as JavaScript when the event happens. And then flow takes care of actually sending that back to the server and actually calling this constructor with this value. So I need to put an event data annotation. It's a new line. Uh, and, and here I need to write a JavaScript expression that will be run to actually, actually get things working. So it's something along these lines, uh, except that it will be event is the name of, of the event object here. And then I want to get the ID of the, of the item that was selected. Uh, which is kind of the same ID that I sent sent here in the JSON. But then also in case nothing is selected, value will be null. So then I use this uh, new-ish JavaScript feature to, uh, if, if value is null, then this expression returns null, otherwise it uses value.id. One word of warning here is that these JavaScript snippets will be used directly as is. And this is a so new feature that it's not supported in all the browsers supported by Vaadin. So this won't work in IE 11, but I won't care about that. So now if you go to this demo, and now when I click something, we get a notification there saying select or deselect if I click the same row again. So the next step then is to also set these selected items. Uh, and to do that, I will need to here in this event handler, I will need to set that property. Uh, but uh, actually, actually see in the documentation, I cannot use just the ID. I need to find the item itself. But in this case, it would be quite waste of bytes to take the whole item and send it to the server just so we can send it back again. So instead, I will just pass the ID back and forth and then instead use a small JavaScript snippet to find the item from, from the items property that we have already populated. So to do that, I do get element 
and execute JavaScript. This is kind of where all the magic happens. Uh, and what I want to do then is this dot selected items. Uh, this refers now to kind of this instance. Uh, and that's an array that contains one item and that's this, which is again the grid dot items and then one of the items from there. Here I use a placeholder variable that I define the value of as event.id. Uh, and this, this thing here, that's, it's kind of like a prepared statement in, in SQL, but the kind of JavaScript corresponding thing in Flow. So I could, in theory, instead do string concatenation but then if I'm not careful, we might get cross-site scripting vulnerabilities and so on. So always instead pass things as, as value or as parameters in this way. And then for the deselection thing, I'm just passing an empty array there and I don't need to put any, any parameter to that. So in this way, we should now see that, that items can be, or rows can be selected, we can deselect them, we can select something else. So yeah, awesome. We're almost done here. But, there's always a but, uh, if I now emulate a slow network, we will notice that when I click to select, I don't get any feedback at all as a user until after the round trip. And that's not really that nice. So what I want to do instead is to make it so that immediately when I click on the client side without involving the server at all, we will update the kind of visible selection here. But at the same time, we will also send the values back to the server so we can run our kind of business logic, which here just shows the notification. So to do that, uh, instead of setting these uh, in the listener, I want to actually, uh, yeah, I want to run another JavaScript in the constructor instead. And there I do add event listener. And the name of the event is the same active item changed. So this, this is just now a, a JavaScript snippet that will be run whenever uh, this grid constructor is, is run. And what I want to do there is say this does selected items is an array containing and here I can just use event detail value so if nothing is selected then there will be an array containing only a null value which grid also will use in the same way as kind of not selecting anything and now with this done waiting for the refresh there we go so now if I make the network slow again we can see that immediately when I click the highlight is updated, but then only with a delay, we get the notification. So that's a great improvement for this particular use case. But there's always a but. Uh, now, as you can see, we are getting kind of a little bit too much JavaScript to have inside a Java file. So uh, I want to extract this into a separate JavaScript file instead, or actually a TypeScript file. So I want to just trigger that once here in the constructor. So kind of init grid and pass this. So the grid instance to it. Uh, and then I want to add a new annotation saying that we had another script file that should also be used. And I will name that grid.ts. And uh, because the TypeScript editor in VS uh, in Eclipse is not so good, so I will instead use VS Code for my TypeScript editing. So here I am uh, in that. I will paste the old code just so I have it handy. Uh, but what I want to do now is to create this init grid function that can be run and it gets a grid and it's a function. But the thing is, well, actually, there, there, there's multiple things here. Uh, if you look at quite much documentation, especially older documentation for how to integrate this and that with JavaScript, like if you look at how to use Google Analytics, okay, well, not Google Analytics, but, but many of these things say that this is what you should do to kind of define your, your global callback or something. 
But now, because Vardin is using a new-ish feature called JavaScript modules, it means that undefined variables that we do here, they won't end up in the global scope as they did in <coughs> with regular JavaScript or old-fashioned JavaScript, so to say. So instead, I need to explicitly say that this should be assigned to window, which is the global scope. But this is not enough, <coughs> because here we are using TypeScript, which tries to protect me from mistakes. And TypeScript doesn't know about something called <coughs> init grid on window. So here I need to tell TypeScript that uh, it shouldn't try to do type checking on this particular thing. And the other thing I can do is to say to TypeScript that this thing that will get to this method, that's actually a grid element that I'm importing here from the JS module. So now with this defined, we have really nice uh, uh, syntax highlighting and, and code completion and anything. So for instance, TypeScript knows that there's a selected items thing here and so on. So we can basically take this old snippet that I had and slightly update it. So this is now the grid. And let's split this up to a multi-line thing just to make it a little more readable. And this is the grid. But then we have, again, one more problem, which is that TypeScript doesn't know that grid fires active item change events that contain a detail, and that, that detail contains a value. Uh, I'm using Vardin 14 here just because I suspect that's what most of you are using. Uh, but in newer versions, this would work. But here I, again, kind of cheat saying to, to TypeScript that it, it shouldn't be concerned about the types for this particular uh, event variable. So now with this in place here and on the Java side, I am calling the init grid method and passing the grid to it. So now hopefully we have the same functionality as before. Now we just have more manageable code. But there is a problem. Uh, we actually introduced a bug when we moved this to the constructor instead of doing it in the event listener. And to see that bug, we need to, to actually do something that finds it. Uh, so what I will do is I will add a button here that, that will toggle, kind of remove and add the grid back again. So if grid get parent is present, then we remove the grid and else, oops, else we add the grid back as the first component. Because now what we will see is that now selection works, yes, and notifications go away, thank you. So now when I toggle, we remove the grid, and now we add it back. And now we see that I get the select not notifications, but I don't get the highlighting anymore. And the reason for this is that, uh, for instance, this listener that we're adding, that state that can kind of be reapplied, because as you see, we're reusing the same grid Java instance all the time. But on the client side, a new instance will be created, because when we completely remove the component, then it will be, become garbage collected on the client side and completely removed. So then when we add it back, a new instance will be created. And state, like what event listeners do we have, that gets reapplied by flow. Children get reapplied by flow. Property values get reapplied by flow. But it wouldn't make sense to reapply JavaScript executions, because those, those are kind of actions. They are not state. So actually, what I need to do here is to wrap this into um, a patch listener, so that whenever this grid instance get attached again, then we run this initialization again. Now, there are a couple of special cases where you might get multiple of these attached events, even though the client side instance is not recreated. So to be on the safe side, we can also here add a small uh, check to avoid reinitializing. So we can define um, weak set that will contain all the 
uh, new weak set, of course, uh, that will contain all the grids that have already been initialized. And then we can do if initted has this grid that we're about to init, then we return immediately. And then we also need to add the grid there. So in this way, we have everything set up so that we can reselect things or toggle visibility and still have everything working. So now here, if I, well, now selection works, yes. I remove the grid, add a new one, and then we still have the selection highlighting there. So yeah, we have seen a bunch of things, but there's a couple of things more I want to show you. The first thing that Simon also talked about was uh, lazy loading. Because here now I'm just setting 100 items and that's quite fine to send as one big batch. But what if we have, for instance, 10,000 items again, then it wouldn't make sense to send all of them to the browser immediately when we open this view. So instead, I want to add lazy loading here. Now this documentation page is still being worked on apparently. It actually says work in progress here. Uh, but if I go to the API documentation, I will find how to do lazy loading with the grid web component. And the way it works is that I need to set a data provider property on the grid. And that data provider is a callback that receives uh, one, one parameters thing, which kind of page and page size and a bunch of other things. And then we receive a callback. And to this callback, we should, once we have the requested items, we should call the callback, pass the items there, and then also pass the total size, so the number of, of items or an approximation. So let's unpack this. Um, let's start on the client side. So we want to do grid.data provider equals something, which get params and callback, and this is an arrow function and here I want to make a request to the server saying that hey could I please get these and these items so how do I do that well the thing is if I go to the component I can add a method here um, request rows that takes a page and page size since that's what I will get from from the client side grid and now if I add client callable as an annotation, then this will get, well, as it says by the name, it will be callable from the client side. Uh, and again, let's just show a notification first to see that we do everything correctly. So request and we have a page and page size, no page size, I said. So how do I call this thing? Mm -hmm. Let's first actually try that out in the browser. So if I select the grid instance, mm, actually the grid itself, not the content, then if I go to the console, and in this context, $0 is the grid. Uh, and here I can see that it has this thing called dollar $server, which is actually injected there by flow through that component instance. And it contains a request rows function. So if I call this with some values, then this notification is shown in this case. So that's what I can use. And now let's go to the TypeScript code to actually start using this. So I want to do grid dot. But then the problem is that TypeScript doesn't know that that flow will inject this thing into into the grid instance. I could again do the same kind of as any trick as I have done with, with some other problems that TypeScript doesn't know about, but I can also define a custom type for this, this thing. So I will define an interface, let's call it custom grid, and it extends the basic grid element, but it also contains this thing called dollar server, and this thing contains in called request rows and the type of that it's a function that takes page which is a number and 
age size, which is also a number. And for now, let's say that it returns void. And now, actually, I also need to say that this thing that we get to init grid, it's not a regular grid element, it's a custom grid that Flow has injected the magic property into. So now, hopefully, TypeScript will know that yes, there is a dollar server, it contains a request rows with which we should pass a page and a page size. So let's take those out of the params object, uh, params.page size. And now if I save this and open my grid again, then we see that we get the notification showing that, okay, page number zero and 50 pages long. That's what has been requested. So now we just need to return the values and actually make grid use them. So what we want to do here is kind of the same thing that we did here with generating items, uh, but we want to move it here into the callback or the client callable thing. And um, this is based on in, 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 integer in, indexes now. So the start is page times page size. And then we can see that we should start at start and we should go, go on until we are at start plus one page size. So then we will get the right items for this request. And then we can just return those items. We need to update the return type of this client callable method. And that's all we need to do on the server side. Now on the client side, mm, no actual client side, I said here we have the client side code. Uh, we need to get this value back. So this thing, it doesn't actually return void. Uh, it returns something asynchronously because we, we're doing a server sound kind of request and then get a response back later. So it's a promise. That's the JavaScript way of saying uh, it will happen later. And what we have here, we have basically an array of something that, that we don't need to know anything about. And now with this, we can directly use, uh, promise is kind of like completable future in, in Java. So you can do dot n and then you pass a callback that gets the value. But JavaScript also has this very convenient thing. I can mark this callback or this function as asynchronous. And then I can just await the value. So these are my items that I await. And then once I get them, I will call the callback and I will pass the items. And if I would do this properly, I would also have fetched how many items we have from the server. But now I will just put a hard-coded number here just to, to keep things simple in this demo. Now with this, we have items in the grid and we have lots of items, or more exactly, we have uh, 100, no, 10,000 of them. And we also see that kind of as I'm scrolling, it's making new requests all the time and always fetching kind of 50 items at a time. So now we have the perfect grid. There's still a couple of small features they also want to show you, but they kind of, they don't really make sense in this grid anymore. So I will just show them kind of as standalone things here. The first thing, is uh, there's a shorthand because quite often what you want to do is just to call a function on the uh, on the custom element that you're integrating so uh, let's create a scroll button here and what i want to do is to get the grid instance get the element and call js function and scroll to index is the name of that thing i remember from the documentation so uh, this actually shows two things. It shows this call JS function. It's just a shorthand instead of doing this dot scroll in, scroll to index and pass dollar zero into it. The other thing we see is that get element is public here. So any VADIN component you have, you can do get element on it to mess with its internal details. With that, you can do lots of interesting hacks and tweaks and stuff. You can, of course, also make the, the thing not work at all. You can break it. But in many cases, it's useful if you have some really small thing that, that you know can be done with, with a JavaScript integration. So now we have this scroll button. And when I click it, I scroll to row with index 42, which is exactly what I wanted. 
Uh, the next thing that uh, in sometimes useful is to get values back from JavaScript in, in, into Java. And to do that, we again do grid get, or not get children, get element. And we want to execute some JavaScript stuff. I don't want to pass any parameters to it. So what I want to do just for the sake of the demo to get the width of this grid. So this dot offset width, where offset width, come on, like this is the JavaScript way of seeing how how wide in pixels an element is. Uh, and then this thing is also venable in a way. So uh, I can get it as either a just consumer that gets a JSON value, or then I can directly convert it to some basic type. So in this case, I want to have a double pass and a callback getting a value. And again, just showing a notification, the width is oh it's value value like so so now when we run this we'll get a new button and this this gets a little bit tricky because what happens here is that when i click this button the browser sends a request to the server the server runs the click handler the click handler says that hey run this javascript then that, that runs in the browser, it sends back in the response. That JavaScript runs, and then it sees that, hey, we should return a value back to the, to the server again. So then the client side of flow sends another request to the client, uh, to the server to actually deliver the value. So that's also what, what we need to use this asynchronous kind of callback waiting for the result to come later instead of just getting it immediately. But still, it works so that it doesn't work. I just get now. And this is a really typical mistake. I did it on purpose, but you will make it by mistake. I forgot to actually return the value here. So whenever you try to get a value back and you just get now, sometimes you actually do something that produces now, but in many cases you just forgot the return statement here because this can actually be, it can be a long JavaScript snippet. You can have like multi-liner with semicolons in there and so on. Uh, but now when I fix this bug, we actually get that now this is 508 pixels wide. And if I click again, we see that it's 831. So that's getting values back. Or another way of getting values back, because we also get values back with uh, the as events. And in a way, this client callable that I show you can also be used for getting values back. But in different use cases, different things are are valuable to use. The last thing I want to show is uh, to synchronize also properties. So for this, we could use an input element. So input is just an HTML kind of text field with minimal features. Uh, and then I want to get the element backing this uh, div that is this whole view and uh, append the, the input element there. So one thing we also see here is that with this div, it's a varding component, yes, I can add a component, I can add an element, I can add another component, and varding doesn't care because beneath the surface, this grid also has an element, and that's what actually gets added, and so on. So in this way, you can even mix and match between the high-level component API and the low-level uh, element API. But what I want to actually do with this input is that I want to add a property change listener to it. And there's two variants, one that takes just a string and a callback, the other takes two strings. I use the two string variant. So the first thing it takes is a property name, and that's value. And then the interesting part, it takes a DOM event. So the name of a DOM event which should trigger actually synchronizing, so reading the value property from the client side element and send that to the server so that it's available there also. And in this case, the event name I want to use is input. And then finally, we have the listener that will be run whenever this property changes. So it, this would also be run uh, if I do server side, just uh, input set property. Uh, uh, notification, no, show notification. Typing is difficult sometimes. There we go. No. 
So here we have it. Um, so I just want to show that the value now is, uh, I get the value in, in the event, so event get value, but to also show you, it's also actually synchronized into the input element itself. So if I get value from here, then we will get the value that was the client side value of the element, which is also then synchronized to the server. So now if I type anything into, or every time I press a key here, we will get the latest value property of the input synchronized to the server, and then we show a notification. Phew. That was all the JavaScript features I wanted to, to highlight. And kind of these are all just building blocks. You can combine them in different ways and use them to integrate basically anything, as long as you know how you would use it with just plain JavaScript, and you know about these flow building blocks, then you can create your own grid component if you think that the voiding grid component isn't good enough, or anything else, basically. So the concepts we have, we have starting from where I started, uh, adding child elements to web components, setting attributes on any components, we can set properties also, though I removed that code already. We can listen to DOM events from the server. We can use this high level component util add listener thing, or we can also use get element .add event listener, which has a couple of additional low level features that might be useful. When listening to events, we can instruct flow to take specific values from the event or also from the element that fired the event and send those back to the server so we can use them for doing something sensible. Then uh, we need to remember that initialization needs to be done every time we attach a component because otherwise it, the client side instance might be removed but the server side instance is still reused. Then we saw how we can extract our script into a standalone file so that we don't have long JavaScript or TypeScript snippets inside Java code. Then we saw about client callable, how we can use that to, from the, ser uh, from the client, do RPC to the server and also pass return values back. Then we have seen shorthand for calling functions. We have seen how to get yet another way of getting values back if you kind of explicitly ask for something, because here's the different thing with execute JavaScript. We are asking, hey client, could you send this thing to us? Whereas this thing with client callable, it's the client that kind of takes the first step and says that, hey, could you please send me this? Then finally, we also saw the, the property change listener to synchronize property values whenever there's a DOM event that kind of tells that, hey, now this value has proper, probably changed and then bonding will take off actually passing that back to the server. So with those building blocks, you can do anything with Flow. Do you have any questions? Thank you, Liv. Uh, that was a great presentation, uh, very powerful. Uh, let's say, feature of, of that in Flow. Uh, there are some questions, so uh, let me find them here in the, the comments. So, does Lightning ensure that the function example in init grid is removed from window when the component that caused, the, caused it to be added is destroyed? Yeah. Uh, no, it doesn't, because what, what this annotation says is that this script should be included in the application bundle. So for performance reasons, uh, every, all, all the different client-side dep dependencies, like all the web components that are part of VOD in itself and any custom things that you add, all those are bundled to one big file. And when you, when you load the page, then all that script is, is loaded and run. So what that means is that this is run just as any other JavaScript, it's kind of permanent until the page is reloaded. 
So this function will be here forever. On the other hand, this is just, it's just code that is loaded. So it doesn't really waste any resources or, or well, it wastes really, really minimal resources. So it's, it's not a problem that it's not unloaded in any way. But then if you do things on the element instance, like the way I do in the beginning, uh, assigned items property to grid, those are kind of, well, the element instance itself is removed. So then also all the values that you put there, those are those are removed. Right. Uh, next question uh, we have here. Uh, maybe I've missed something, but what is the advantage of doing it with JavaScript, TypeScript, and not only in pure Java on server side? There was already some conversation in the chat about it. So um, it's a comment by Matti as well. So please free, if, feel free to to jump in, Matti, also if you want. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's, I, it's, it's basically implementing components. So so you saw some very like tricky JavaScript tricks bit by lay, but never write that kind of code into your own application. Write those into your component implementations and hide it there and create a nice looking Java API on top of that code. Yeah. So basically these are these are the things that all the Vardin components are using internally. If you open, for instance, grid.java, it's well, it, it isn't actually full of these things because grid.java has so much bookkeeping for, for manage, managing data providers and so on. But it still has a whole bunch of those kinds of things using exactly these mechanisms. And these are low level things allowing you to integrate anything. Uh, but then definitely you as a kind of component developer, it's your responsibility to create a nice Java API so that you can kind of get all the abstractions that you're used to, to using. You get you you implement support for something once, and then you can use it anytime you want. So that that's the kind of point. Uh, because what this do is it allows you to do things that are just impossible otherwise, and and that's the whole point of it. Yeah, and this is this is kind of what the actual flow framework provides. So flow flow framework is actually providing these low level things. And then what you as a flow developer actually use is usually the component implementations that are built on top of this API. So quite 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 that often if you are using Vardin flow, then you are actually using Vardin components, which are using Vardin flow to in, implement this Java API for you. Yeah, but as an example, uh, just today in Vardin directory, there was a new interesting add-on released. Uh, it lets you, it basically it adds a new feature to the grid component because the grid component apparently <laughs> didn't have a, a way of scrolling to a specific pixel position or to get back to the server what is the currently scrolled to pixel position. So then someone, it, it was a Vardin employee, but anyone could have done that. They created an add-on, basically a small Java class that uses these kinds of mechanisms so that it can just do, I think it was kind of grid scroll something dot scroll to, and then you just give the coordinates as a Java Java call there. And then behind the scenes that internal uses these kinds of mechanisms to, to actually make it happen because the Vardin grid class, Java class itself didn't provide a way of doing it, this, but it's possible using JavaScript. Yes, so it was basically kind of an extension to the Vardin, Vardin components. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Um, very kind of a low level, let's say, part of of, of Vardin that allows you to uh, extend even like Leif mentioned in, in, with this uh, add-on, extend the features of existing uh, components. Yeah. I, I would say it's the assembler of Vardin. It's the assembler of Vardin. Yeah. <laughs> I like how that sounds. Yeah. Uh, so be responsible when you use it and design yes. a, a good API for for the um, for the actual application layer or presentation layer of your applications. So I have another, oh, look, this is kind of a comment, but let's address this. Uh, it seems quite fragile having to use screens that the compiler cannot check. Yes, that's absolutely true. And that's one of the reasons why I also moved out this 
no, actually, yeah, exactly this. I moved out a bunch of code to a standalone TypeScript file that can be checked. Of course, like we have uh, here and there, there are some some script files that, or script, hard-coded strings that still cannot be checked, but that's kind of, that's the price you pay for using assembler. So there is unfortunately not any way around it. Uh, but again, kind of try to limit the exposure, try to do as little as possible as magic strings, and then give a nice, safer Java API around it and move the as much of the client side logic as possible into, into a separate file that can be checked by TypeScript. Right. Um, okay, here's another one. Let's see. So if I have multiple usages of this method, I'm not sure what's this method. I need to ensure that there are no collisions similar to namespacing. Yeah, it I guess that method. refers to this init grid function that I yep. published in the global namespace. That is absolutely true. Uh, we are thinking of a way of dealing with that also, but we haven't implemented it yet. So I, I would recommend that kind of do a little bit of namespacing in anything you, you publish as global things like this. So kind of instead of just init grid, it could be om acme init grid or something just to mm -hmm. reduce the risk of, of collisions. Kind of putting in place your own uh, namespace. Uh, where in the code tree do I put those external? Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yes, files. I That's forgot to show that. Uh, it's inside the front end directory in the in the project itself. So anything that should be handled by the by the client side build, so TypeScript files and and so on, those go into the the front end uh, directory. And then an additional question: Where do I put it when I'm building a reusable add-on component? Uh, SRC main resources, something I don't remember. You can Google it. <laughs> yeah, but it's a different pl place if you want to. It's a different place. Yeah, the, the easiest way to find it is that you go to vadincom slash start, and there you have you can download a kind of add-on skeleton project, and that has a file in the right location for that purpose. I guess it's also documented in the. Uh, it is surely yeah, documented it's somewhere. It's well documented, yeah. Uh, we can try to share a, a link to uh, to that page uh, later. Uh, let me see. I think there are more coming here. Okay, here's a comment. Would you find a way that would be awesome, especially when using multiple component libraries? It would be helpful. Uh, and this is an actual question. Uh, Easier to integrate, extend third party components than it was with GWT? Uh, it depends. I mean, it's it's easier in the way that, that uh, you can use all the features that the component you integrate provides directly. Whereas with GWT, you always had to kind of how do I use this stuff from, from Java code? Uh, and it's also easier in the sense that you can usually just copy paste examples and so on from the documentation of that thing. But on the other hand, it's not as easy because you actually need to know JavaScript and types or and or TypeScript instead of just being able to use Java all the way through. So it's it depends a little bit on, on your preferences and so on. And here I actually found the answer to the previous question because I looked how grid is implemented. So inside the grid flow jar, it's meta inf resources front end, and that's the location of the of the grid connector file, which which contains all the. It's actually quite scary file because it's there's lots of things to integrate here, as you can see. But that's the location. And then, of course, to get this into, into the right place inside your jar, it's SRC main resources, meta in resources front end. In a Maven yeah. project. 
Yeah. Which I assume 80% of all users use and the others use Gradle, which use the same conventions. Yeah, just want to share this uh, answer. Um, somebody uh, saying that it, I think it's easier. I think they're referring to uh, uh, GWT. Yep. Since, uh, oh yeah, since we can use existing JS examples and not have to translate them to, to GWT. So there you go. Uh, um, that's a valid answer as well. And Philippe actually uh, identified the, the, um, the folder. Yep. Already, just after that, you put uh, front end, and there's there, that's where you put the, the files. Thank you, uh, Philip. Uh, what else do we have? What's the time? So we have uh, around the four minutes. How do we uh, quickly uh, go through the questions that that, that we um, had for Simon? Um, now it's tricky for me to to find them here, but I, I have taken note of, of that. Uh, uh, so some ideas about optimistic loading. I think it was uh, locking probably. It's a typo. Optimistic locking support in a similar project. Uh, if Simon has any idea or experience on this, or any of you for that matter. I at least use optimistic locking in all my all my hobby applications that use JPA. So that's quite quite the same way as with whatever. Java applications you have. So you just have the version. If you're using JPA, then you can just have the version version field in your entities and then just wrap the save action in a try catch clause. And then if you get the optimistic locking exception, then you shall somehow deal that with the end user. You can either show the differences or then just say that, sorry, your changes were lost or whatever you want to do there. But yes. naturally, you want to do you want to use the latest part in addition, the collaboration engine, and then then you never have these optimistic locking exceptions again. <laughs> so then then you actually see when somebody else is using the or, or editing the same entity. Yeah, the only problem with the optimistic locking is if you're not the only one who is dealing with this database. So this is the case in my project currently. So we don't use a version field. We use all the fields of the database table to do optimistic locking. And this is supported by uh, Juke out of the box. So with Juke, you can define the optimistic locking mechanism. Either you use a version field or a timestamp, or you use uh, all the fields. And that's what we currently do, because we have background processes that uh, manipulate data that, we, that uh, don't work. Because we built something like you mentioned, we have a kind of a, we don't have a collaboration engine, but we have a mechanism to, to lock data on the application layer. So if a user opens a certain record, he gets a notification that it's currently edited by someone else with the username and he can, he cannot chat with him. Maybe we should integrate the collaboration engine. That would be a nice uh, use case for that. It sounds like so. Um, okay, so this is, I think, the the question that that Matti was uh, talking about before. Since Simon just mentioned data intensive applications, could you sh shed some light on how to efficient efficiently collapse all nodes in a tree grid? My tree grids have around one hundred k nodes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the one that I was I was wanting to comment before. So yeah, yeah. We when we did the data provider lazy data provider changes. Uh, we didn't have time to actually look into tree grid at all, so it's it's quite from data pointing data pointing point of view, it's quite a different piece than than showing just like tabular or data in a grid. So so we still need to look into that at some point to make the lazy data pointing in tree grid work well. It doesn't currently. It's 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 quite tricky still. I, I don't know if, if that is possible, even. All right, thanks. Thanks, Matti.